Welcome to the inaugural episode of Sustainability, the Business Opportunity of the 21st Century, a podcast with Tom Fox and Richard Blundell. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox with Richard Blundell. Richard, first of all, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, sir. It's so great to be with you again, Tom. Richard, I thought we would just explore sustainability. You are obviously, or our listeners will, if they don't know, you will learn you're incredibly passionate about this. But your passion is not simply limited to green or other environmental perspective. You see this as a business opportunity, perhaps some risk, nevertheless a huge opportunity. But before we get to this opportunity, could you tell us a little bit about your professional background and what brought you to this point in 2023? Thanks, Tom. So my background is I've had a little bit of a fitful start. I went to university and they didn't want me to stay around very long. So they asked me to leave after my first year. And I think the reason for that is I just, I I think a learning is a, an extremely powerful experience. And when I went to school, it was all, it was all learning by rote or memorization, which I wasn't very good at. But I started in business and, the, and I wasn't at all interested. And what I really wanted to study was, was geology, um, which is the story of the earth, essentially. And I'd been fascinated by it my entire life. But I was counseled by my father. That was a dead-end career. And he couldn't, for the life of him, figure out how I would ever make a living from that. And I ended up going to the UK and starting a business with a couple of other guys that I didn't really know very well. We essentially provided maintenance services for the oil and gas industry, but really refineries. And from that, we actually morphed into an environmental service company that uh, we made equipment that actually cleaned oil tanks. And then we recycled the, the oil and we eventually got into cities and cleaned sewers and Anyway, it was the start of a journey, and uh, and I've always, when I got kicked out of school, one of the first things that I did to get money to actually go to Europe was work on the oil rigs. And uh, and uh, the guy who was the field ge- geologist, who I got to know quite well on one of the sites, I thought he had the best job on, on the planet. He got to be outside in nature all day long, and he took these readings, these logs, essentially from the well, and he would take them out and he would tell me these stories about that went back hundreds of millions of years about what had actually happened in this spot that we were drilling. And I just thought it was the most fascinating thing. And then when I had time off, he would take me to where there were outcrops, rock outcrops, where you could actually visibly see strata of sediments and rocks, etc. And he would then go and tell me the story of what had happened here. And I just said, wow, that's so fascinating. So I always have been interested in the earth and the story of the earth and the well-being of the earth. And that's how it all started. So from that, bring us up so the last five years or so. And what's your passion now? Yeah, good question. So I, throughout my life, I've worked in, in, in green industries, if you like, very early on. So I saw... I was at Rio in 1992, which was the very first Earth Summit. That was the first real global conversation on sustainable development. And it was a bit scary because we were starting to realize that the planet was warming and it was likely caused by human activity and that was likely caused by burning of fossil fuels. And so that narrative started to get more and more pronounced and there was more research. And the work that I was doing was always trying to solve those problems or to put a plug in the drain, so to speak, rather than think of it differently. And I think the thing about sustainability is that it really is a mindset. And the mindset that we've had for the many generations that I worked in this field early, dating back to the late 80s, early 90s, was doom and gloom. It was always the death insurance story. We're trying to avoid our demise rather than seeing it as a life insurance story or looking at it as an opportunity. So the last five years after having lived abroad, I lived in Europe and Asia for about 38 years. In the last five, six years, I've returned home to Canada. 
and uh, and I got very involved in two particular areas. One was in teaching. I teach at the business school at the University of Toronto, and I do some other lecturing at other business schools as well around the world on this topic. And uh, and the other thing is I'm working with early stage companies that have technologies that appear to, that I think are going to really be material in their impact. And so I think of sustainability now as a a mindset around the opportunity which is I think sustainability is the source of innovation that will drive all of the new growth that we will see in the next decades to follow. Richard, we both have been through a few economic cycles, I would say, in our lifetime. And the one I'd like to maybe highlight here was Y2K. Leading up to 1999, at the end of 1999 and the change in the millennium, there was a lot of information about potentially computer crashes on a worldwide basis. And what struck me about that was not the doom and gloom, but the solutions that companies worked on the problem and they created an answer and then they marketed that answer and people like you and me purchased that answer in the form of new computers or software upgrades or other. And if I can take it to a sort of a non-business situation in 1971, I think, or 72, was maybe 72 was the first Earth Day. And I remember that because I was in what we used to call junior high school, now called middle school, and somebody came to our, our little hometown and made a presentation. And the number one problem for the world on the first Earth Day was population growth, <laughs> ZPG, zero population growth. That was the goal. And now we've had a myriad of other problems that are highlighted on Earth Day and every other day of the year. I guess from those two examples, what I learned was, yes, there can be problems, but humanity's response is to find solutions. And so whether it's a technical problem like Y2K, whether it was a human issue, ZPG, or zero population growth, or whether it's now the burning of fossil fuels and the man-made contribution to overall global climate change, I'm fully confident that we will come up with a solution. And I don't know if that is too simplistic an approach or characterization of what I thought I heard you say, but I view sustainability as a part of that continuum and the sustainability and all the way down to the startups you work with will drive innovation and that innovation will help us. Will things ever go back to the way they were? No. But that's just the nature of history. It doesn't go backwards, it goes forward. I guess when I hear someone like you talk about sustainability, it really engenders my belief in humanity and that mankind, literally across the globe, will seek out and find solutions, but it will be driven on a business basis. Now, there are other players, you've named several of them, Obviously, governments, places like the institutions like the United Nations, nonprofits, NGOs, et cetera. But you really see this as a business opportunity. So I wanted to, with that incredibly long-winded introduction to the next question, (laughs) do you really see this as truly a business opportunity and something that can be, if if not drive the world economy, be a part of a driver of the world economy over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it was, I loved your long-winded introduction to this question because all of what you said makes total sense to me. Yeah, no, I think there, this is the largest commercial opportunity that we've ever seen in humanity. And Mark Carney has said that as the UN envoy for the climate on numerous occasions. The estimates vary from a hundred trillion to much larger numbers um, over the next two decades. And there is just no other opportunity of this size. And I, as I was, I was, I was reading an article this week that actually PwC produced, which actually there, they've estimated that, that nature. So the title is nature's decline poses a risk to more than half of the global GDP. So I think Tom, if you look around the room that you're in right now and try and point out objects or 
anything that's an object in that in the room that you're in and see if there is any of them that doesn't have an input from nature. I think you'd be hard pressed to look around the room and say, there's nothing in here, or there is something in here, sorry, that doesn't have an input from nature. When you look at this, when you read an article or you read a headline like that, and it's uh, the research has revealed that there's about $58 trillion of capital at risk from nature's decline. And they go through and they look at where that's happening in different parts of, and, it, and, they, and, it, and they conclude that it is going to be, it's going to affect all major, 19 major stock exchanges in the world, and that it's going to affect over 163 industries, sorry, economies. And, uh, and so you, when you look at that, you think, oh my goodness, you've got, well, there's two ways to think of it. One is I'm going to curl up in bed and just hope for the best and be depressed for the rest of my life. Or you look at that and you go, oh my goodness, what enormous opportunity that is. And that's the way that I look at this. And I, the reality is the numbers are enormous. It is the largest opportunity. And there's a couple of other things that are happening that make this kind of really interesting. So from a regulatory standpoint, there's something called scope one, two, and three emissions. And those are becoming regulated. And Scope one and two, for just to make it simple, are scope one are the emissions that I, I, that I'm directly responsible for the operations that I own or lease. Scope two are the is basically the purchase of energy for use in my operations that I own and lease or lease. And then scope three is everything else. It's everything in my supply chain, and it's everything that my customers produce when they consume the product or service that I sell them. And though, as we start to regulate those, so one and two are fairly highly regulated, and they're regulated in the U.S. The SEC has standards. In Europe, they've actually now regulated scope three, so that's no, now law. That's really tough. Now you're responsible for the emissions that you uh, that are created, sorry, in your supply chain to make or deliver or distribute whatever it is that you make that you sell. And it also has an implication on your customers' use of your products, right? So if I'm using, if you and I are sitting now in front of computers, the manufacturers of these computers are on the hook for the emissions that are being generated for the use of the electricity that you and I are using at the very at this very moment. So it becomes a an, enor an even bigger opportunity. Hard to figure out because a lot of the scope three stuff is behavioral. So that means changing behavior, very difficult to do, probably the hardest thing to do. But it offers an, enor an enormous opportunity for companies to rethink how their products are used and consumed and their services as well. And then the other thing that's happening at the, at a, or we're in the process of is the largest transfer of wealth that we've ever seen on the planet. That's expected to be over the next 30 years. The estimates are somewhere in the low 50 trillions. And that means that there's going to be a shift or a transfer of wealth from look largely from the baby boomers, from our generation, Tom, to this next generation of millennials and Gen Z, or Gen Z, sorry. And, uh, and so the good news about that transfer of wealth is that it's going, that the people that are going to inherit this wealth, and it's not just individuals, it's also charities and other institutional beneficiaries, they actually care a lot about this topic about climate change and they and they care a lot about social justice and social equity and diversity and inclusion and all of those things are very much a part of sustainability so for me sustainability is essentially it is the long term it is the long term efficiency and resiliency of resources that generate enhanced social environmental and economic outcomes so could we take that maybe very high level thought down to an individual, whether it be an individual with an idea, whether it be a company with an idea that may do one thing and how do people, and you can draw on your experience in advising, obviously startups, but how does an engineer or an innovator think through some of these concepts in terms of the opportunity and equally important, the product or solution they want to bring to the market. 
So I, I don't think it's all that complicated, to be honest with you. I think there are a number of things that factor into this. One is getting, just getting started. So I think there's a guy that I found very inspirational. His name is Mick Epling, who's got a business called Not Impossible Labs. And his man- mantra is commit, then figure it out. And I think that's what it's all about. You have to make a commitment to actually do something and then you figure it out. So you don't need to have it figured out when you start. Uh, You just need to make the commitment to actually do something. And then once you've made the commitment, you'd be surprised how smart and ingenuitive we are. I wanted to read, this is Sir David Attenborough at COP26 in Glasgow, so 2021. And he said, after we are, after all, the greatest problem solvers to have ever existed on Earth. We understand this problem, a new industrial revolution powered by millions of sustainable innovations is essential and is indeed already beginning. So he's right. We're really good problem solvers. We're the smartest species, as you mentioned, on the planet. But our problem is that we get weighed down by all the doom and gloom, and it creates a mindset which inhibits commitment. It inhibits action. And so all you really need to do is to just make a commitment to do something and get started. And once you find, once you get past that, you find ways to get things done. The other thing about this this particular opportunity is because it is so vast and it is so big, and complicated. I don't think that any, I don't think, I'm certain that there is no single company that can come in and say, I'm going to solve this particular problem. It's all about building ecosystems now. It's about collaboration because it takes a collaboration of both the private and public sector to solve some of these really big complex issues. And so you really need to be open to collaboration, you need to be very well networked. And the other thing is it's about experimenting. It's about your ability to try things, to fail quickly, to learn, and then to do it again, or to try something different again. So it is commitment, it is building ecosystems, being collaborative, it's your ability to do these sort of small experiments to fail quickly and learn and then go to the next iteration and to know when there are no other iterations because you're going down the wrong path and it's never going to work anyway. And then it's about speed. It's because one of the things that's happened in our lifetime, of course, and certainly in the last few years or the last couple of decades, is the the, work, the pace of innovation is now exponential. And that's largely driven by fourth industrial revolution technology. So those are AI, IoT, all the, that new sort of big data analytics that is just adding tremendous speed and, and velocity to innovation. So you have to also be fast. You can't plod along anymore. And so if you're going to be, if you need to be fast, it also argues for the fact that you need to have partners. You need to, you can't do everything. You just got to, you got to figure out what you're really good at and stick to that and find people that you need to actually deliver a whole solution, like a complete solution, right? And that means partners. And the last thing I will say, which is what I've learned in startups, is that there's two things. One is process over genius. Means It means that it, do, it doesn't matter how many smart people you have in the room, but it, if you don't have process in place, it's very difficult to build something quickly and to, do, and to fail fast without having a series of processing, processes in place because this allows for you to actually create accountability and to measure performance and progress. And the other thing I've learned is that simplicity scales and complexity does not and that that holds true for everything it's not just it's not just your ability to innovate you should not like complex you got to take all the complexity out keep it simple because it's much easier to scale something that's simple than it is something that's complex but even more importantly it's much easier to communicate 
something that is simple rather than something that's complex. The more complexity in communication as well, the more likely you're going to you're going to go off the rails, right? So those are the lessons I've learned. I hope that I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it does. It does, but unfortunately, Richard, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but I look forward to continuing this conversation. Likewise. Always a pleasure, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to the inaugural episode of Sustainability, the Business Opportunity of the 21st Century. We've linked to Richard in the show notes, so I hope you will reach out to him. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. Sustainability, the Business Opportunity of the 21st Century is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.